So I think we are going on right now. So, nice to everyone. Nice to see you, everyone. Uh, today is a great opportunity to have here someone not local. I know that you're normally used to have someone from the Czech Republic, but today uh, here with us is someone I really admire, someone very special, and you can see him in the middle. It's a Scott Ritter. Hello, Scott. Can we hear each other well? Is everything working? I hear you fine, and hopefully you can hear me as well. <laughs> yes, and let's uh, let's add some some information for you. This English, uh, this uh, video is going to be in English for you, but you all the time will see subtitles down. So, no problem for you. You will understand everything. What is amazing, uh, I'm, I'm really thankful to uh, Henry, to Jindřich here, because he provided this interview. So Jindřich, thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, how it will work here. So some brief information for you guys. Uh, I will ask Scott questions from you. You sent a lot of questions, different questions. Some questions, they just were really similar, very the same. So I tried to choose questions really like, you know, to hear different opinions. The second thing, this is um, not TV. So we will speak freely. We will say our opinions. You will hear different perspective, different points of view. I know that you are very interested in uh, conflict in Ukraine, so we will talk about it. Um, let's say some things before we start. What is the goal of this um, video or this discussion? It's just to provide you some information from someone who is very experienced and had and has a great career. I will tell you more about Scott about soon. What is uh, very important for you to know is that uh, all the questions are from different people from different backgrounds. So uh, I tried to not to, you know, to like uh, put some way. They are very different. So be ready for that. And um, next, next thing for you is that uh, you can debate under this video. You can have different opinion, you can have a different um, you know, point of view. So don't be shy, just uh, discuss it with other people uh, below. It's okay, you can tell your opinion. And um, now let's, uh, let's uh, tell something about you, Scott. If you feel that you want to add something, just uh, feel free to add it. So who is Scott Ritter? Um, Scott, I, I took this information from uh, Wikipedia. So really, if you feel something to, you want to add, just do it. Scott Ritter is a weapons inspector, writer and lecturer. Worked with United Nations weapons inspector in Iraq within 1991 till 1998. News analyst for CNN and NBC television networks producer of documentary film Shifting Sands, The Truth About Iraq. It was in 2000. Military service, you worked uh, and attained rank of major. You later became uh, a critic of United States foreign policy in the Middle East. You served with the United Nations implementing arms control treaties during Operation Desert Storm and in Iraq overseeing the, the, the disarmament of weapons of mass destruction. Sorry for my English, guys. It's, it's a six o'clock in the morning in Vietnam. <laughs> if it's not perfect, <laughs> just forgive me. Yeah, let's, uh, let's say, uh, Scott, is it okay for you? Would you add something? Uh, well, I mean, I'll say this. Um, who am I? Look, I'm, I'm as human as everybody else. I, um, I was the child of a military uh, officer, um, I, I grew up overseas. Um, I, I went to three different high schools, one in Hawaii, one in Turkey, and I graduated uh, in Germany. Um, I went to college. I studied Russian history. I, um, I joined the Marine Corps. I got my commission in the Marine Corps in 1984 as an intelligence officer. 
And uh, I spent the first couple of years um, learning how to kill Russians. Uh, I mean, it's a cold war and uh, the Soviet Union was the enemy and um, we were preparing for war with the Soviet Union. Um, and we, we prepared very intensely. Uh, it, it was, it was, you know, I guess it was real training, <laughs> you know, it's not fake training, real stuff. Um, uh, fortunately, I was never uh, compelled to do that against the Soviet target. Instead, uh, because of my Russian history background, um, I was selected to uh, serve as an inspector in the Soviet Union, uh, implementing the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons. Um, and I spent two years working outside of a, a Soviet missile factory in Vodkensk, about 750 miles east of Moscow in the foothills of the Ural Mountains. Um, and th that was literally one of the highlights of my military career was that that opportunity. Um, when that finished, I, um, I got a chance to use my military uh, training uh, because we went to war against Iraq. And I served uh, in Iraq or in Saudi Arabia under General Schwarzkopf's uh, staff. Uh, because of my experience with missiles, I was given the uh, counter scud uh, portfolio, and I spent the war uh, trying uh, working with special forces, the Air Force, and others uh, to try and kill Iraqi scuds before they could be fired against Israel or Saudi Arabia. Uh, the war ended. I had what's called a good war. That means that I didn't get killed, and um, whatever I did, people were happy with. Um, and because of my background as an intelligence officer. Uh, arms control. You know, the important thing about what I did in the Soviet Union was we wrote the book on on-site inspection. Before what we did in the Soviet Union, no one ever did on-site inspection. Nobody knew what it was. Uh, we wrote the book. Um, and so the United Nations had a problem after the Gulf War that uh, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and they needed to um, locate them and get rid of them. So they brought me in as an intelligence officer who wrote the book on on-site inspections uh, who knew something about Iraqi missiles. Yeah. And I was, yeah. um, I, I participated in that project as a chief inspector for seven years. And uh, I went to Iraq over uh, 40 times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, had, a, had a, I think we accomplished our job. The problem was there's a lot of politics involved in it. Um, and in the end, I ended up resigning my position from the special commission because I disagreed with the American approach, which was more triggered towards getting rid of Saddam Hussein than getting rid of weapons of mass destruction. And I've been critical of, um, of, of, of U.S. policy ever since then. Uh, but, you know, being critical of U.S. policy doesn't make me anti-American. Um, I'm as pro-American as you can get. I, I put on the uniform, prepared to die for my country, and I'm still prepared to die for my country. And if somebody threatens my country, I can become a Marine real quick. Um, but, you know, one of the beautiful, the, the great things about being an American in my standpoint is that the government works for me. I don't work for the government. Um, and I get to hold the government accountable for what it does in my name. And when the government does things that deviate from the norms and values that we claim to represent as a nation, um, when we carry out a foreign policy that lacks integrity, um, it's my responsibility, especially if I have expertise. I mean, when we talk about arms control, I know a little bit about arms control. So when I look at my government's policy about arms control and I think that it's deviated from the the, the what we have done in the past, I have a duty and responsibility as an American citizen to speak out. And the same thing with military affairs, um, the current situation in Ukraine. Um, you know, I have some expertise in uh, large scale ground combat. Um, and I know a little bit about the Russian military. And uh, when I take a look at what's happening in Ukraine, I realize that um, my government, Ukrainian government, and the European governments weren't telling the truth about what's going on, how this war started and what's going on, on in Ukraine today. So I felt compelled to speak out. So that's what I'm doing. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's my responsibility as an American citizen and frankly speaking, as a global citizen to, to do this. So that's why I'm, I'm very grateful for, for you having me on here and have the opportunity to engage in this conversation. Yeah, uh, we are honored, we are honored, uh, Scott. Uh, just before we go to Ukraine, I think I think it was you. You said it very clearly. You're not uh, anti-American. You're just criticizing the government and its policies, which is which is completely different. There are there are these are two different uh, things. So, we, just before we jump on Ukraine, uh, you became famous of like criticizing the uh, the second Iraqi war uh, because you are saying that there are no weapons of mass destruction, that they have no facilities to manufacture weapons of mass destruction. And later on, I have also uh, realized that you are 
uh, criticizing the, the policy in Syria because you said that there was no chemical attack in, in Syria. And uh, I think like, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of uh, people called you uh, co a conspiracy theorist because of that. But in the end, uh, I believe there was, there was uh, you were right on all of, all of the occasions. And, uh, you know, the world still thinks that there were chemical attacks in Syria, but I'm super convinced that it was, it was, it was not the case. So maybe if you can oh. just, just briefly speak about uh, these two things, because that, that made you famous and you, you <laughs> basically went against uh, the mainstream, uh, but in the end you, you were proven right. So that's, that's, I think, the most important stuff. Yeah, on Iraq, um, you know, I spent seven years um, as the lead intelligence uh, professional in the United Nations. That means that every nation in the world went through me uh, to provide information about in Iraq. And then I was the lead inspector for many of these issues in Iraq. So I would receive the information, I would build an inspection, then I would lead the inspection into Iraq, and then I would return. And then the cycle would begin again. I was also the guy that traveled to all the nation capitals and dealt with the senior um, government officials. Uh, so I would brief the British government on inspections. I would brief the German government. I would brief the French government. I would brief the Dutch government, the Israeli government. Uh, and I would go to the White House. I would go to the State Department. So I wasn't some little puny person. Um, I, I, was a, I was very much at the center of everything that was happening. So when I resigned and said that the, the, the case for war is exaggerated that we could account for 95 97 percent of iraq's weapons of mass destruction we know that they're eliminated and that we could mitigate against concerns about the unaccounted for material by noting that we were monitoring the totality of iraq's industrial infrastructure you know my problem was how do you claim now that iraq has weapons of mass destruction do you have some new information and when the u.s government admitted in, 19, in, in 1999, 2000, that they didn't have any new information. They were simply reevaluating the old information. That meant that I knew everything the U.S. government knew, which means the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and I was saying it as loudly as I could. Unfortunately, we, we see the control that government has over mainstream media and the ability of government to shape a narrative. When you have the one guy who knows everything about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction telling you there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, not being believed because the government has decided to have somebody uh, contradict me who has never been in Iraq, doesn't know how to spell WMD, um, etc. We have a problem when the, the people tend to believe the, anybody but me. Um, as you said, history proved me right. But you know what? That's not good enough. Being proven right after the fact isn't good enough because we went to war on a lie. Yeah. Thousands of Americans died. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqis died. Millions of Iraqis suffered because of a lie. Um, so maybe I didn't do a good enough job trying to convince people. And I've always looked back on that and said, what more could I have done um, to, to do a better job of educating people? And again, that's, that's why when you said you want to talk, I said, hell yeah, I want to talk because uh, having this kind of discussion hopefully will generate, you know, debate and dialogue and people start to question the official narrative and draw their own opinions uh, because I didn't do a good enough job back in 2002, 2003. I failed because we went to war, even though I knew the truth. On Syria, you know, I wasn't in Syria, but I know a couple things about inspections and I know a couple things about chemical weapons. And I took a look at the entire narrative that was put together and I said, you know, this ain't right. It's like, you know, I, I don't want to give myself too much credit, but it's like a, a brain surgeon. You know, once you're a brain surgeon, you, you know a little bit about the brain. You know about brain surgery. And you may have retired, but now if somebody comes on TV and they're talking about brain surgery and you're going, no, that ain't brain <laughs> surgery. Uh, no, we don't do it that way. No, that's not, that's not how the brain functions. Not, you, you, you know, I, I think you're able to say, hey, I got a problem with their saying because that's wrong. So when I listened to what people are talking about, the Syrian chemical weapons program and the attacks and stuff, I went, this isn't right. Uh, nothing, something, for instance, um, there, there was, a, there was a, a, a village that got bombed by a Syrian aircraft, an Su-22, uh, Khan Shakun, I think it was. Um, and they're showing the radar track of the airplane as it comes in. And I'm, okay, I'm following the radar track. Now, 
I happen to have a background in uh, aviation. I, I, I flew OV-10s and OA-4s. I know about dropping bombs. I know how airplanes work, uh, military aircraft, delivery munitions. And I know that when you drop a bomb, it doesn't magically divert in flight and end up pointing in another direction. When they say the airplane came in this way, but the bomb was facing this way, I said, nah, that didn't come from that aircraft. Can't. It's impossible. Plus, I looked at the whole flight parameters. It didn't happen. But when you bring this up, people are like, oh, you're a, you're, 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 you're a conspiracy theorist. I said, there's no conspiracy here. Physics is physics. A bomb being dropped from an airplane is you know, physics decides where it's going to go. And if it's somewhere else, then that airplane didn't drop that bomb. Um, and, and we can tear the story apart over and over again. So I, I, I felt that I needed to speak out because clearly the official narrative was a lie. And also the thing you need to understand is the people telling the lie are the same people that told the lie last time for the yeah, same reasons. Yeah. So, you know, we, it's not like you can lie about Iraq and suddenly we're supposed to believe you about everything else. I think we have a duty and responsibility to be very skeptical about the information, especially when the information doesn't add up. So, yeah, I, I spoke out against Iraq. I spoke out against Syria. And I'm speaking out against Ukraine today. Yes. Yeah, well, it's, that's marvelous. I just, I just wanted to, to before we go to the questions of the of uh, our viewers, uh, just uh, one question because I think in the uh, well, the the, the, the beginning uh, mm -hmm. base of uh, all of this uh, stuff is the cause of the conflict, like why this is happening. So, if you are looking at Ukraine, uh, what is your opinion? What is the main cause of the of the war of the current situation? The main cause of the war is NATO expansion. End of story. If it weren't for NATO expansion, there wouldn't be a war in Ukraine today um, because everything falls from that. Uh, NATO expansion encompasses a lot of things. It encompasses not just the physical expansion of NATO from 12, 13, 14 to now 30 uh, members, but the mindset behind it. NATO expansion incorporates a total disrespect for Russia. Um, a total disregard for agreements that have been made between Mikhail Gorbachev and Western leaders about the expansion of NATO. Not one inch eastward, the Russians were told. Not one inch. Oh, no, they didn't go one inch. They went a couple hundred miles. Um, you know, it, it, the, the absolute disregard uh, for Russia. NATO expansion also encompasses the redefinition of what NATO is from a defensive alliance to an alliance now that is capable of taking on offensive preemptive military action. One only has to look at the history of what happened in uh, with, with, with uh, Serbia and Kosovo to understand that NATO is not a defensive alliance. NATO carried out a war of aggression against Serbia. One only has to take a look at what NATO did against Libya, a war of aggression designed for regime change. Um, take a look at NATO's presence in Afghanistan. Why is an organization called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, North Atlantic, uh, sort of defines the geographical uh, dimensions of this organization. Why are they in Afghanistan? Uh, why is NATO today talking about a presence in the Pacific? Because they're an expansive, aggressive organization. Um, and this is a mindset. Uh, this mindset led NATO to invite former republics of, uh, of the Soviet Union, Ukraine and Georgia, to join NATO in 2008. Um, you know, Russia made it clear at that time that this was a red line, that they weren't going to allow this. Um, and it's not speculation on my part. The, a guy named William Burns, who today is the director of the CIA, in 2008, he was the uh, ambassador of the United States to Russia. In February 2009, he wrote a memorandum called Nyet means Nyet, no means no, meaning when the Russians say no expansion into Ukraine, they mean no expansion. You know what he said? If we continue with this policy, he said, there will be a war in Ukraine, and Ukraine will lose Crimea, and they will lose the Donbass. Wow. So we knew what we were getting into, we being the West. We knew exactly what the consequences were, and yet we did it anyways. Uh, NATO expansion also deals with things such as regime change in Russia. Now, you say, wait a minute, regime change? Come on, that's a conspiracy. You can't be talking. Well, you remember 2009, the reset? The, the red button, the little red button that uh, Hillary Clinton presented to Sergei Lavrov. Uh, yeah, it was yeah. long, it was something different. Ha, 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 ha. He said the power of the I'll push, push the button. Right. Well, you know, the thing about the reset is what, what did it symbolize? 
the reset was 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 the brainchild of um of, of, of Michael McFall. At, uh, in 2009, he was advising. He's a Stanford professor, a uh, Russian area expert, who was advising Obama on the National Security Council about Russian affairs. Prior to Obama coming in, something happened in Russia. Uh, they have a constitution. Imagine that, uh, the rule of law. And uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, uh, was constrained by the constitution to only having two consecutive terms. So Putin did a, a little little trick. He switched places with Dmitry Medvedev. Medvedev was the prime minister. Medvedev became the president. Putin became the prime minister. You know, we can talk about democracy and is this right? Who cares? It's Russia's business, not my business. Um, but Dmitry Medvedev is now president. So what was the reset about? The reset was about the United States taking advantage of Putin's absence as president to reach out to Dmitry Medvedev and say, we are willing to improve relations with Russia as long as you stay president. Putin can never come back into the Kremlin. He's done. Um, that's called regime change. And we know this is the case. Uh, in, 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 in 2011, uh, then Vice President Joe Biden, familiar name, he's the president of the United States today, flew to Moscow and uh, had a meeting with, imagine this, Russian opposition figures. So he's speaking to the Russian political opposition. And he says, if I were Vladimir Putin, I wouldn't run for office, run for president again. It'll be bad for Putin. It'll be bad for Russia. Sounds like a threat to me. Sounds like interference in the domestic pol political affairs of a sovereign nation. Um, Putin doesn't care what Joe Biden said then. He, I don't think he cares about what Joe Biden says now. Putin ran for uh, election, and he won in March of 2012. He won the election. This angered the United States furiously. And since that time, they've been working overtime to undermine Russia, undermine Putin. And a key element of undermining Russia and Putin was to strip Ukraine away from the Russian sphere of influence. And the best way to strip Ukraine away was twofold. One, to get Ukraine to join the European Union, as opposed to be remaining in the Russian economic orbit. And the other one was to get Ukraine to join NATO. Both of these were red lines. Now, the Russians actually yielded on the, on, on the European Union. They said, you want to join the European Union? Join the European Union. But we're not paying for it. And uh, Ukraine realized they couldn't afford to join the European Union. So their president at the time, I think uh, Viktor Yanukovych, uh, said... We're going to stick with the Russian orbit. Then a demonstration began in 2013, carried on in 2014. Initially, it was a peaceful demonstration, but so, somewhere in January, February 2014, something happened. It turned violent. It turned violent because the United States unleashed the Ukrainian nationalists. Wait a minute, Scott, that's a conspiracy theory. Really? The CIA has admitted that from 1945 to 1990, it funded the Bandera movement the organization of uh, Ukrainian nationalists. Um, they funded them. They funded them initially uh, to carry out military operations. Um, now, people say military operations. They're just Ukrainian nationalists. Of course, they're opposed to Stalin and the Soviets. Except during that time, they killed over 120,000 Polish civilians. They killed over 100,000 Russian civilians. No, they're not against the Soviets. They're against anybody who's not Ukrainian. They're Ukrainian nationalists. Uh, they're, you know, very racist. They're, they believe in the supremacy of the Ukrainian um, and nationality. And so they killed these subhumans, the Poles and the, and the Russians. Uh, fortunately for the world, the Russian military, the Soviet military defeated them. But as a political movement, they survived both in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine, funded by the CIA. The CIA maintained close relations with these people. In 2014, the CIA unleashed Ukrainian nationalists, turned the anti-Yanukovych uh, demonstrations into a violent demonstration. It became a coup d'etat, a violent coup d'etat carried out by these virulent neo-Nazi nationalists who now seized control in, uh, in Kiev and then began a, 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 a genocidal um, a, you know, movement against ethnic Russians and Russian speakers. Um, you know, they went to Odessa, stuffed 150 pro-Russian demonstrators into a trade union building, set it on fire, killed nearly 50 of them. Then they unleashed themselves on the Donbass. Um, you know, the reason why the Azov regiment is called the Azov regiment is because they moved into Mariupol on the Azov and they began 
to terrorize the ethnic Russians who now rose up against them starting the crisis. Um, now, again, now we say, well, what's NATO got to do with that? Well, fortunately for us, unfortunately for the Ukrainians, um, a, a president, a former president named uh, Poroshenko came out and made an amazing statement. Because you see, after the Donbass rose up and there was this fighting, the world tried to stop this fight. The Russia wanted to stop it. You know, the, the, the Russians that rose up in the Donbass originally said, hey, we want to secede from Ukraine and become Russian. And uh, Putin said, no, you're Ukrainian. We were going to respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Imagine that. A Russian president said that. Uh, and he meant it. Uh, he said, we're going to have Minsk Accords. We're going to agree to these Minsk Accords which means we're gonna negotiate a settlement that gives you autonomy, respects Russian rights, but you're still part of Ukraine. But the Ukrainians never ratified this. The Germans and the French said, hey, we're gonna encourage them to ratify it, but they never did. From 2014, 2022, eight years, nothing happened. Why? Poroshenko just gave it away. He said, we were never gonna ratify Minsk. The whole purpose of Minsk was to buy time so that NATO could train the Ukrainian army to have the capability of launching an offensive that would take over the Donbass and Crimea. So NATO was involved in a plan with the Ukrainians to use Minsk as a vehicle to buy time until a military was trained. Now you say conspiracy theory, Ritter conspiracy. No, NATO put a permanent base on the soil of Ukraine. The United States Army brags about the fact that every 55 days it trained a new battalion of Ukrainian forces to NATO standards who were then sent to eastern Ukraine to fight the Russians, to kill the Russians. The Americans bragged about it. We're fighting them over there, they said, but we don't have to fight them here. We were part of this. We knew what we wanted. We knew we wanted war. But when people say who's responsible for this conflict, NATO's responsible. The United States is responsible. Europe is responsible. Well, wait a minute. Didn't Russia invade? Isn't that the way it worked? Yeah, it did. But the amazing thing about the Russian invasion is that it's about as legal as it can get. You're a lawyer. You know, you understand these things. Um, the Russians are very clever legally. Um, the Donbass was Ukrainian, which means that Russia, under its own constitution, really can't get involved. But then because they refused to ratify Minsk, the, Don, the, the Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republic de declared their independence. And Russia recognized their independence. Now they're sovereign entities. Now Russia can engage in something called collective security. Russia didn't invent this. You know who invented the concept of collective security in terms of supporting preemptive military action? NATO. They did it against Serbia in Kosovo. So Russia simply took the NATO playbook and applied it to Ukraine. They carried out a preemptive um, defensive attack uh, against the Ukrainian military, which was literally amassing 60 to 80,000 troops were building up in Eastern Ukraine to launch an attack that was supposed to begin in March against the, 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 the Russian separatists in Donbass. So Russia launched a preemptive strike. This is totally legal under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. Completely legal, but the world ignores that. They say Russia brutally invaded Ukraine without any provocation. No, there was huge provocation and Russia carried out legitimate collective self-defense to stop NATO and Ukraine from fulfilling the plan that Poroshenko has acknowledged. The building up of Ukrainian military by NATO as a proxy of NATO to launch an attack against Russia in the Donbass and Crimea. Hmm. Uh, here is a question following. Uh, this is uh, from Vladimir Novotny. Uh, I will I will say in English for you. Uh, do you think uh, Scott is Ukraine a U.S. money launderer? Did they remove Trump because of this? Do you see any pre-war connection between Zelensky and the U.S. government? Um. <laughs> if, there was, if there was if there was a connection between the um, Ukrainian uh, government and the Democratic Party in the United States, look, we we know we we know there is. I mean, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist. First of all, when Joe Biden's son Hunter, who has no qualifications whatsoever, uh, gets invited on the board of Burisma, uh, you have to ask yourself what what what's going on here. Uh, you know. 
Yeah, it's an enrichment scheme for uh, Hunter Biden, but it's also about um, the United, you know, Burisma taking advantage of connectivity with uh, Joe Biden to get the United States to support policies that enrich Burisma and Burisma board members. So it's a giant money laundering uh, scheme. Um, there is a um, a Ukrainian whose name is slipping my mind begins with a P, um, but he he runs a, um, a a think tank type organization uh, used to be run out of Crimea. Uh, now that the Russians have Crimea, it's it's elsewhere. But he was very closely linked to uh, Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation. He provided um, significant uh, financial uh, backing for that. Um, you know, the, the 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 Ukrainians have connectivity at the highest levels of the Democratic Party, um, and you know, Donald Trump, I think, um, saw this and was trying to enact policies that um, that responded to this, and the system turned on him. I mean, you know, the, the impeachment was empowered by a CIA agent working in the National Security Council who illegally leaked information about a phone call that was taken out of perspective, out of, out of, and um, he was conspiring with a um, active duty military officer, Alexander Vindeman, who was working inside the National Security Council, to again leak this information illegally to lawyers, to the media, to anybody, to create a scandal. Uh, they worked with Adam Schiff, and it, next thing we know, we have impeachment over a phone call that Donald Trump was making because of concerns he had about the corrupt actions of Joe Biden and his son Hunter Biden. Now, could Trump have been smarter in how he dealt with this? Uh, I, I think so. I think a, uh, a more experienced politician would have been able to navigate these waters, these shark-filled waters. Um, you know, Trump wasn't smart, um, and Trump ended up, you know, getting caught up in this uh, in this scandal. But this scandal was all about defending the Democrats from the accusations being made by Donald Trump. I, I, anybody today that takes the time to to study. The linkage between the Democrats and Ukrainians would have to understand that there is there is definitely connectivity there. Um, is it the the main engine that's driving this boat? No, corruption often isn't the main engine. Corruption often takes place on the periphery, where people take advantage. Take a look at the the photographs of all the Obama era uh, experts on Ukraine. Every time they visited Ukraine, they all got the uh, the photograph of them uh, at a at a Ukrainian uh, energy installation wearing a Burisma jacket. I mean, uh, Evelyn Farkas asked her about the photograph that she has. Other uh, all the other officials have the same photographs. Why? Why, if you're a U.S. government official, do you have to wear a Burisma jacket and go and go to one of these facilities? What's going on there? Is that really in the interest of the national security of the United States? Are you part and parcel of a scheme uh, where we exploit? The, uh, the corrupt nature of Ukraine to enrich our and, and, and enrich our partners. Well, I remember the, the, the famous video where Joe Biden is bragging about, you know, like calling the uh, uh, Ukrainian president and saying him, if the state attorney is not uh, fired within six hours, you lose all your financial support. Which is Son crazy. of a bitch. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, how the, 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 the you know, U.S. official can threaten uh, a sovereign state that they will uh, lose all of the su financial support if they don't fire their own state attorney who was in, in that time investigating Burisma. You know, like, this is crazy. No, th th look, the whole the whole thing is is literally, if, if I were an editor at a major publishing house and somebody presented me a novel where this was the premise of the novel, I'd say it's it's not realistic, man. No, come on. It, 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 this could never happen. It would never happen. Um, the truth literally is stranger than fiction. You will tell him, make it more realistic. Come on. More realistic, yeah. <laughs> Nobody can be that corrupt. <laughs> so, uh, guys, I'm, I'm going to put here a new question, and that's... Uh, Again, a little different question, but uh, it's connected with the uh, theme we are talking about. Uh, this is uh, this concerns a lot of people in Czech Republic right now, Scott. Russia called the Czech Republic an enemy for actively supporting Ukraine. Are we in danger? What does it mean, according to you? 
the the enemies list put out by Russia is purely a, a political gimmick. Um, the because you know Russia, uh, I, I think the the cause and effect relationship is actually that Russia was labeled an enemy by the Czech Republic first. They were part of a, this European uh, piling on on Russia. Um, is the Czech Republic in danger? Not from Russia, not directly. Russia's not going to invade the Czech Republic. This ain't going to be Prague 1968. Uh, that just isn't going to happen. Um, unless, of course, Czechoslovakia decides to um, throw its weight behind NATO intervention in Ukraine. And then all bets are off. Um, you know, once, once if there's a general war between Russia and Ukraine uh, and NATO, um, you, you, you know, you, you, you you sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. Okay, and um, people need to understand that. Um, but Russia, right now, I, I believe Russia is going to limit this military operation to the borders of Ukraine. It's not going to extend beyond it unless NATO wants to extend it. If NATO wants to fight, as, as as Putin said, okay, we can do that. You think you can beat us? Why don't you try? But um, you know, NATO can't beat Russia. Um, it's just mm-hmm. plain and simple. But Russia's not looking. Lie. Go ahead. Uh, so we have some problem, problem with, the, with the sound. Uh, I heard your speech where you are saying that basically NATO is provoking Russia to go to war, and you are saying that uh, if, if there is an open war in in Europe between NATO and, and Russia, that NATO will flat out lose this this war. So uh, flat out lose. Yeah. Ask your ask your uh, ask your uh, Czech generals. Uh, how much ammunition you got, guys? Seriously. <laughs> How many artillery pieces do you have, first of all? How many not, of them not work? Too many. Not too many. Yeah, not too many, but how many of them work? How many have actually been trained? Have you, have you trained on them lately? Are you guys really good at this? Okay, and now you're going to get into a, a war with a country that um, actually believes in artillery. I mean, in a big way. The Russians love artillery. They got a lot of them. And they apparently have an endless amount of ammunition because they're firing 60 to 75,000 rounds a day. I don't know if the Czech Republic has 75,000 rounds in totality. Um, who knows? But NATO will run out of ammunition in two weeks in a war in a war with Russia. Two weeks, you run out of ammunition. And then it's over, guys. Okay, it's over. That's with Danya. Um, there's not much you can do about it. So it would be stupid and foolhardy for NATO at this point. And, and why did NATO get to this point? Because there was a time when NATO you know, had the resources to carry out um, sustained conflict with the Soviet Union. But they allowed their they, they, they allowed their capabilities to dissipate. Um, Europe became addicted to the peace dividend. You stopped investing in your military. You stopped. You reduced your military. What military you had, you put in the barracks and you didn't train. When was the last time you actually turned on the engines of all your tanks and make sure they work, make sure they can drive? You have the spare parts to maintain them. Um, and it's not just the Czech Republic. The Germans are horrible. You know, the big vaunted German military could barely get a reinforced battalion to deploy to Lithuania. The British, you know, they used to have 80 to 90,000 troops in the British army on the Rhine during the Cold War. Now they they have 72,000 troops altogether. Uh, they were barely able to get a battalion to send up to Estonia. Now, Jan Stoltenberg uh, in, in Madrid said, hey, we want you to beef that up to a brigade size. The British are like, well, we don't have a brigade. Um, <laughs> <can't do> that. <laughs> you know, that's just the reality of it. But You know, the threat to the Czech Republic isn't from the Russian military. The threat from to the Czech Republic is Czech politicians. All right. What's going to hurt Czechoslovakia this winter is uh, the fact that the Czechs have signed on to these sanctions, which have crippled Europe's economy and the Czech economy as well. Um, where are you going to get your gas? I don't know. I mean, that's a Czech problem. But, um, you know, And, and even if the Czechs can solve that problem, are your neighbors going to solve it? Uh, I, I and, and, you know, when you're part of the European Union, you're part of an economic union, which means it's half of the union collapses. The other half's not going to do well either. So uh, the Czech Republic's not insulated here. But this is where the Czech Republic's going to get hurt. And it's not because Russia wants to hurt the Czech Republic. It's because the Czech politicians have put the Czech Republic in a place where they're literally going to have some serious economic Uh, problems. And people need to understand that when industries shut down, uh, sometimes they don't reopen. <laughs> you know, it, this isn't going to be a planned, careful, coordinated shutdown. It's going to shut down because there's no gas, there's no energy. We got to shut down. It's not profitable. We got to lay off everybody now. Uh, lights are out. 
Um, and you just don't walk right back into that uh, because your labor force now is dissipated. Uh, your workers are going to be desperately looking for other jobs elsewhere. Um, your, your, your equipment's not going to be maintained properly. Uh, it, you know, it, it's over. And, you know, there, the German, some German economists have said that if, um, if the things continue on the track that they are, Germany is going to be suffering great, uh, you know, economic damage uh, that it hasn't seen since the end of the Second World War. Well, my God, we bombed Germany into the Stone Age in the Second World War. So the guy's saying basically that because Germany signed on to these sanctions against Russia, the harm that will befall Germany will be the equivalent of being bombed by Allied bombers during the Second World War. Well, guess what, Czech Republic? You're about to get bombed by Allied bombers, but it's not really. It's it's the own stupidity of your politicians that have put you in this situation. Um, I'm not saying that the Czech Republic has to blindly support Russia, but you have to be realistic about about, about you know the totality of the picture. You don't have to say um, that Russia it, 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 it's it's okay that Russia invaded Ukraine. You're allowed to say no. We're not good with that. You know what? And that's okay because it's not a good thing. Anytime one country invades another is not a good thing. It would have been nice if a diplomatic solution could have been out there. But did the Czech Republic really do everything possible to get a diplomatic solution? Or did they just play the NATO game? Did the Czech ambassador to NATO sit there at the table and pound his fist and say, we must do everything possible to make sure Russia doesn't invade Ukraine, which means we have to treat seriously the Russian proposition about a new European security framework. Can we at least talk about that? Or did he sit there and nod dumbly every time Jan Stoltenberg said, we're going to do what the Americans tell us to do? I think it's probably that he was nodding dumbly. Um, and now you're paying the price. Now you're paying the price. Um, and it, at some point in time, I, and, I, and I say this to everybody, this war is going to end. One way or another, it's going to end. It's probably going to end in a decisive Russian victory, but it's going to end. What is Czech Republic doing about that that time period is the Czech Republic working to find a, an off ramp off of this path towards confrontation? Are they figuring how they can resume a normal diplomatic relations with Russia to normalize economic uh, interaction with Russia, or is the Czech Republic just being stupid and following the United States wherever it tells them to go, including if that means jumping off the cliff like a bunch of dumb lemmings following each other as they go on their suicidal trek? Um, I don't mean to be critical here, but you know I'm critical of all of Europe. I think Europe has yeah. failed itself. Um, it's high time Europeans start looking out for Europeans. It's it, it's time to stop thinking that the United States cares about you. We don't. We don't care about you at all. We like to visit you. Prague's a beautiful city. Czech, Czech Republic's beautiful. I love the concept of tourism. I've been to Prague. Um, great beer. Good music. I mean, nice place to visit. But at the end of the day, yeah, the American people, first of all, most of them couldn't point out Prague on a map. I don't mean to be insulting, but they don't know where the Czech Republic is. Um, they don't know much about Europe. They don't care about France. They don't care about Germany. They don't care about Norway. They don't care about Italy uh, unless they're visiting there. Um, but the notion now that Europe has sold its soul to the devil, and the devil is America. NATO is not a European security alliance. It's not. NATO is an extension of American national security policy. NATO does what America wants it to do. That's why you were in Afghanistan. You weren't in Afghanistan because the Afghan uh, threatened you. You're in Afghanistan because we told you to go there and you followed. You, you know, it, it, NATO is not there for the benefit of Europe. And it's time Europe start thinking about a European security framework. What's good for Europe? And I'll tell you what I think is good for Europe having guaranteed access to cheap gas that Russia provides. That's smart. That's good business. Um, Russia's your neighbor. America's not. <laughs> Come on, use your head. No, I would just like, uh, uh, just one sentence. Well, uh, our prime minister was telling in his speech to the nation uh, that uh, uh, basically Russia started the economic war against the trade war against Europe. But I think it's vice versa. I mean, Europe started the trade war against Russia because they were imposing the sanctions and they were, you know, trying to stop everything. But I think it's a suicidal mission, you know, because they're like, we cannot win. We don't have the gas. We don't have the oil. They, they have. You know. Yep. Uh, look, it wasn't Putin that stared 
Joe Biden in the eyes um, in uh, in June 2021 in Geneva saying, I'm going to impose massive sanctions on you. It was Joe Biden that stared Putin in the eyes. And Joe Biden was speaking on behalf of NATO because NATO, after all, is America's little compliant poodle. Um, so that's that. And I think we have to cut it here. Uh, I got I got I got to run. So we'll pick it up uh, at nine o'clock. I'll click on the same link. Perfect. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you Thanks. very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon.